Good morning. I'm John Ravitz, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for the Business Council of Westchester. On behalf of our President and CEO, Dr. Marsha Gordon, and our Board Chair, Heidi Davidson, we want to welcome everyone to the Business Council of Westchester's Political Leadership Series. Uh, as many of you know, uh, our Political Leadership Series is part of our ad advocacy program. Uh, the goal was to be able and continues to be able to bring uh, to our members uh, political leaders uh, to discuss uh, their priorities, their initiatives, and to engage in a conversation uh, regarding issues that are affecting the business community. Uh, we really utilized our political leadership series over this last year during the pandemic. Uh, for those of you who were not able to join us, uh, we were able to give, again, our members the opportunity to hear not only from the accounting executive and the commissioner of health, but the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the New York State Assembly, the majority leader of the state Senate, uh, the New York State Attorney General. Uh, and today uh, we're able to bring to you uh, Westchester County's new district attorney, Mimi Roca. And let me uh, also just give a few uh, logistic announcements. Uh, for those uh, folks who would like to uh, pose a question, please utilize the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, when the district attorney has finished her presentation, uh, I will be taking questions from the chat box and the Q&A box. Uh, to give to her. This is also being broadcast live on Facebook and a recording of this event will be on the Business Council of Westchester's business resource page starting tomorrow. So for those of your colleagues or clients and others who uh, were not able to join us this morning, they'll have an opportunity to see the program. Two upcoming events uh, that I'd like to just have everybody put on their calendar. Next week on April 20th, we will have our virtual reception for the Westchester County Board of Legislators. Chairman Ben Boykin and members of the Board of Legislators will be again talking about the priorities that they are working on as well as take questions. And then on April 30th, uh, we will be doing our, our, our usual annual Albany Lobby Day it will now be a virtual Albany Lobby Day, uh, but it will be on Friday, April 30th. Uh, it will be from nine o'clock to 2.30. There will be some breaks, um, but we have a what I think is a really solid lineup of people uh, for the event. We'll have Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, uh, EJ McMahon from the Empire Center will give an overview on the recently passed state budget. We will have uh, the Westchester Assembly delegation, the Westchester Senate delegation led by Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins. Uh, our lunch speaker, and people can just bring sandwiches and sit and, and, and watch, will be Casey Styler, who is the editor of the Albany Times Union. And then we will hear from Assemblyman Harry Bronson, who's the chair of the Assembly uh, Committee on Economic Development and Job Creation, and Senator Anna Kaplan, who is the Senate chair of the Senate Committee on Economic Development and Small Business. And we'll end the day with a representation from Bob Mojica, who is the budget director for New York State. But today we're very excited because uh, as soon as uh, we knew that we were going to have a new district attorney, uh, for Westchester County. We wanted to have her engage with our members because her office is involved in so many of both uh, areas that our members uh, uh, should know about. And let me introduce our, our, our district attorney, uh, Mimi Roca. Let me tell you a little bit about her distinguished career. She was elected in November, 2020 after running a grassroots campaign centered on an aggressive platform for reforming and modernizing the Westchester County DA's office rebuilding trust between law enforcement and the communities it serves, and fighting for a safer and fairer criminal justice system for all of Westchester. From transparency, accountability, and conviction integrity to reducing gun violence and better addressing mental health issues, DA Roca's comprehensive ambitions vision for the DA's office is based on her 16 and a half year career as a federal prosecutor, where she prioritized victim-centered, trauma-informed policies and on her personal experience as a daughter of victims of crime. DA Roca served as an assistant U.S. attorney from 2001 to 2017 in the Southern District of New York, where she oversaw the prosecution of organized crime, gun traffickers, corrupt public officials, narcotic dealers, sex traffickers, and child predators. She received numerous U.S. Develop Department of Justice awards, including the 2016 Women in Federal Law Enforcement Leadership Award. In 2012, under President Obama, she was promoted by U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara to Chief of the Westchester Division for the Department of Justice. In that position, she served as a primary liaison with law enforcement agencies and other prosecutional offices 
including the Westchester DA's office, and coordinated and co-chaired multi-county task forces on specific issues such as human trafficking and opioid overdose epidemic, the opioid epidemic. She has organized and led numerous forums in Westchester on public corruption, sexual and domestic violence, and online child predators. Prior to her career in the uh, SDNY, DA Roca clerked for Judge John Gleason of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York and Judge Chester Straub of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. She also worked as a litigation associate in the law firm of Kravich, Swain, and Moore. And more recently, DA Roca was Pace University's School of Law's Distinguished Fellow in Criminal Justice and a legal analyst for MSNBC and NBC News. DA Roca, thank you for joining us today. Thank you uh, for the work that you've already done uh, in your office in your first year. And the, the platform is all yours. Thank you, John um, and Marsha. Um, thank you for putting this together. Thank you for your patience. We had some rescheduling, um, but it's great to be here and addressing this group and being with you. Um, I, you know, I, I imagine that most of the people on this call hope that they um, never have to deal with us through their businesses, that, that, that our only contact is in me uh, talking to you about the um, great things that we're doing in the DA's office. Um, so you, you, that's, that's most people's wish when they meet me at this point now that I'm the DA, but I, I, I would think certainly um, business owners in particular. So we'll try to keep it that way. Um, I have just finished our first 100 days in office. Um, and we've done a lot and I'm really proud of that. I'm proud of my team. Um, we push ourselves every day to turn um, words into actions. That's, that's my, my new way of thinking about this. I've spent a lot of time talking about what I wanted to do and um, what I hope to do uh, to make our justice system more fair, to make the Westchester DA office um, a real model for nationally, for around the country. Um, and I now have had the opportunity for over three months to actually put those words into action and it feels really good to be able to do that. And we have a lot more to do, um, but we're really um, making headway and, and starting. So I wanna tell you um, about some of those areas. And then of course, um, we'll be able to take questions uh, as John said, to hopefully follow up in some areas that you're particularly interested in. Um, I'll start with an area that, you know, there, I, I think there's two areas really at top of mind right now nationally. Um, and, and I know for, for me and for many people here in our community, one is hate crimes and bias incidents, and the other is police reform. So I'll start with the hate crimes and bias incidents. Um, obviously, this is an issue. It's not a new issue, but it's an issue that has been growing um, really to a, a fevered pitch around the country. Um, over the past few years. And, you know, I'm not here to assign blame at this point. It isn't about what got us here. It's what we can do now. Um, this is a very personal issue for me. I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. My father, um, literally with his parents, escaped Romania in the nick of time. Um, I have many relatives who did not get out and who perished in concentration camps like, like many others. Um, and so I really personally feel an obligation to work on this issue and to understand that um, something I saw from the Holocaust Museum or, or maybe it was the Auschwitz Museum recently, that it began with words. And um, so that's one of the approaches that we've taken to this issue, that we in law enforcement have an obligation not just to react when things become um, violent, as we have seen in, in certain parts of the country, um, when things um, get out of control, but to try to work preemptively and preventatively. Um, there's a limit to that. I'm not going to say we, especially in law enforcement, um, can stop all hate and bias incidents, but there's a lot we can do. So um, together with the county executive, we've launched the Speak Up Westchester social media campaign. Um, to encourage both people who are victims of hate crimes or bias incidents to report them um, and witnesses to report them. Um, we've launched a new hotline to make that easier, to give people another avenue in our community. It's 914-995-TIPS and we can send you that information to help us get it out 
to the community and we've been spreading it far and wide to different community groups. Um, it gives people an option. Obviously, if there's an emergency, people still will call 911 or call their police department. But sometimes things, you know, I, I look at all of law enforcement as, as sort of putting together a puzzle. And what may seem like a small piece of the puzzle to somebody, though deeply upsetting, could be something that we piece together with other small parts of the puzzle. So the tips line, it's not just for hate crimes. I can talk about this in a few minutes, but it is also for reporting um, law enforcement uh, related uh, complaints, um, public integrity issues, uh, worker safety issues, immigration uh, related issues, um, probably forgetting some, but uh, elder abuse. And we have it, we, we set this up new and it's, you know, it works. It, it's in several different languages, Spanish, Mandarin, uh, and several others. And it directs people by subject matter and language to a different voicemail box. They leave a message and there are trained prosecutors and investigators who actually get um, the messages. And I know personally that they are looked at and responded to, whether it be a referral to another agency in our government or having an investigator reach out to the person who left it. Um, but I see the email traffic, so I, I know it's actually happening. Um, but basically we wanted to have, I'm trying to make the DA's office more accessible to people in general. So this is one way to do that. I appointed a new hate and bias crimes coordinator, Catalina uh, Butros Bianco, uh, and she is um, excellent, um, very proactive. She's out there um, really every day I'm thinking of new and proactive ways to reach out to communities, uh, to coordinate with law enforcement. Um, and it, along those lines, we are leading an effort um, with our law enforcement partners, the county police, uh, the Human Rights Commission, um, and, and, and the local departments to restructure, reinvigorate how hate and bias crimes um, data gets reported, because I think that's a very important part of us being able to prevent um, by tracking um, sort of where incidents are starting to happen, what groups are involved um, before they escalate. And so we're really working on this reporting requirement um, and that will involve the Westchester Intelligence Center, which is um, sort of a data analysis center um, run by the DA's office that we are repurposing. Um, as well as the real-time crime center from the county police. So it's, it's obviously not something the DA's office is doing alone, it's a partnership. And I think um, our community members feel safer when they see that all the different parts of government are working together, you know, across law enforcement, the uh, county executive office, the Human Rights Commission. And so that's been a big focus and, and goal for us is to coordinate and show that publicly that we are working together. Um, another area that is obviously first and, and foremost in everyone's mind uh, right now, um, and it has been for some time, is police and law enforcement integrity. And I'll say that, you know, I include in that um, the DA's office. I, I never look at law enforcement and say, you know, you have to change, you have to do this. It's all of us. It, it is a, a collective we. Um, and so one of our focuses is in the DA's office on increasing our focus on ethics and integrity. We have a series of um, trainings that are uh, coming that, that really are, are focusing on that. But more importantly, um, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis now, the questions that get asked of all of the prosecutors in my office of uh, as we're reviewing cases are ones that are very focused, I would say more so than in the past, on the ethics and integrity of all involved and making sure that we are holding ourselves to the absolute highest standard. I've established new positions um, in our public corruption and law enforcement integrity um, bureaus, I've divided those up, I've given them direct and daily access and reporting to me and my executive staff. These are cases I um, work on pretty much daily with them uh, in terms of reviewing them, um, bringing in experienced people, both promoting from within and from the outside. Um, I think that you know it's just a very important goal to make sure that people can have confidence in law enforcement 
and in our public officials. That, that is part, again, of what gives people uh, a feeling of safety. Um, we are working with police departments to increase our scrutiny of police policies. I recently sent a letter, for example, to a particular police department um, telling them that we thought that their strip search uh, and uh, related policies were out of date and laid out the law for them and told them that we thought that was needed revising because we were seeing um, systematic and, and um, repeated failures in that area, which is obviously very serious. That's separate and apart from whether we can bring criminal cases, but as the DA with a countywide perspective, I feel that that is an important part of my obligation. Um, we have set up, I'm very proud of our conviction review unit. Um, we brought in, hired um, Anna Heger, who uh, is an extremely experienced and respected in the exoneration field. She's uh, from the public defender's office where she led their exoneration work for many years. Um, and it was really um, quite an accomplishment, I will say, to even get her to come and, and help us set up this historic first autonomous um, bureau in the DA's office. And we're just getting started on the work, but I will say there is a lot to do. Um, and I think it will really help increase, again, public um, trust in our office and in the process. Um, in general, we are also um, focused very much on uh, worker, uh, sorry, on crime victims. And basically almost, I would, I would put it um, in terms of increasing our customer service to them, making sure not just that we're prosecuting the cases, but that we are um, serving them in every possible holistic way that we can. Um, so we have created a new, again, historic cold case bureau led by an experienced homicide prosecutor um, who is solely dedicated to this work along with investigators and we're working on protocols um, for those cases that we are going to uh, make transparent and public and involve the community. Um, but we're already working with police departments and we've gotten uh, just a wonderful reception both from the law enforcement side as well as from uh, families of victims who, you know, really don't stop um, hoping for justice. So that that is the the goal of that bureau. Um, we have added a new leadership position in our special prosecutions division, um, which was already a strong division, but really I think needed more resources. And uh, we brought our adult sex crimes unit back into that division where um, it belongs. This division handles. Um, some of the um, hardest and um, most um, uh, rewarding in some ways cases that our office does, domestic violence, sex crimes, child abuse, elder abuse, human trafficking. I mean, these are the cases with our most vulnerable victims. Uh, we instituted a policy where um, uh, on day two, I instituted a policy that um, families of all homicide victims um, and, and violent crime victims uh, should be contacted by our office within 48 hours. That wasn't happening before. And I think that's an important part of our um, obligation, not just to contact them when it's our time to prosecute the case, but to reach out from the beginning and offer them support and services and let them know that we're here. Um, we have uh, added a grant position from the federal government to work on human trafficking. Um, we're working with different legislators to help support their legislation, supporting the rights of crime victims. So those are some of the things that we're doing um, in that area. Um, I am the daughter of um, uh, crime victims, and it's something that um, is, is very personal to me as well. Um, I've really seen the justice system through the eyes of uh, victims of violent crime, and um, I know how important it is. So I, I, I hope and I think that that comes through every day um, in the things that we're doing in the office and our approach uh, to cases. Um, apologies, because my dog is here, and so he needs to go for his walk. <laughs> so we have a brief, a brief pause. Um, we are doing a lot of work on immigration and worker safety. Um, this is an area that I think kind of existed in name only before, uh, and, and now we are adding real substance to it. I've hired a, a former defense lawyer with um, extensive experience in immigration issues 
uh, Saad Siddiqui, um, who also was on uh, part of the Human Rights Commission previously, and he's leading and coordinating our office's efforts on immigration collateral consequences, outreach to the immigrant community, which I think right now is more important than ever, um, and is working with our new uh, labor crimes and worker safety coordinator uh, to um, put together a task force. We've, I've been on many uh, meetings and calls with them already um, with different um, groups representing uh, the immigrant community and labor community, um, as well as labor unions to um, talk about how we can um, make their lives uh, more safe, um, how we can ensure that their rights are protected, um, and how we can reach out to the business community to um, help educate and inform um, and bring people together around this issue. Um, we have done uh, quite a bit on the issues um, outside of what I've already talked about, uh, criminal justice reform, diversity and inclusion. Um, I have been very public in supporting some legislation at the state level uh, along this, these lines, like the uh, advocating for the walking while trans ban, which was signed into law earlier this month, um, advocating for the restoration of voting rights for formerly incarcerated New Yorkers on parole. Uh, we've partnered with Moms Demand Action and Westchester School Districts on a safe storage initiative. We're doing quite a bit on um, gun safety. This is uh, one of, example of, of projects that we're doing um, to help educate people about firearm um, safe storage and uh, trainings to help keep guns out of the hands of children and out of the hands of people um, who might uh, commit suicide. Um, this is one of the laws that we have that we're fortunate to have in New York, one of the progressive uh, gun safety laws, but laws are only as good as you know we actually inform the public and implement them. So we're working on that. We are uh, working on trainings for what's called the red flag laws, which again are another uh, example of laws that I think are really a model here in New York for gun safety to try to get guns out of the hands of people before they become violent. Um, and so we are uh, going to be having, I think this month, um, some training for our prosecutors um, as well as law enforcement on uh, these ERPO or red flag laws. Um, it's something that, that was a big victory to pass, but quite frankly, not enough people even in law enforcement know about them or how they work. So um, we're, going to, we're gonna do a series of trainings on those. Um, one of the first things I did in the first few weeks was to dramatically increase the diversity of the leadership in the DA's office. We still have a long way to go on diversifying the office um, as a whole, but uh, the you know I think it begins, frankly, at the top. And um, we put uh, about 15 women and five people of color into new leadership positions just by promoting people from within the office and uh, of the few lateral hires that we did. Um, I think these were all you know done on the merits. Um, they were people that, frankly, I think were overlooked in the past. Um, and I've been very happy with those, um, those moves. And I, I just think it's really important, particularly in a place like a DA's office, to have a diversity of leadership, not just diversity in the office. We created the first diversity and inclusion committee in the DA's office, led by Lila Curtin, who's on my executive team. Um, and she um, is putting together a committee of people at all levels in, in the office. Uh, to help um, ensure not just that we're diverse, but that we're inclusive in our policies and our approach to cases in our trainings and in our hiring. Um, we are hiring an outside expert to significantly expand diversion and alternative to incarceration programs, um, both reducing the barriers to entry for existing programs and then increasing the type and number of programs that we have, particularly for um, misdemeanor offenses around the county. Um, we can talk about this a little bit more, um, but you know, I know this comes up a lot. I, I think this is an area we could um, make use of in uh, with repeated shoplifting uh, and those kinds of offenses that I'm hearing a lot about um, on a daily basis. 
Um, so those are some of the things that we've been doing. There are more, and as I said, we still have a long way to go, but um, I'm very proud of what we've done already in a short, short time. Um, you know, my approach, my vision um, for the DA's office is obviously first and foremost, we are about public safety and we will prosecute lawmakers and there will be times where we are perhaps even more aggressive on prosecuting cases um, and using our resources um, to prosecute violence, um, harm to our most vulnerable members of communities, sexual abuse, child abuse, uh, exploitation, corruption. Um, but I, I think that's only one part of our job. I think that as public servants, prosecutors have an obligation to go above and beyond that and not just be um, adversarial and advocates for one side, but it's our job to also ensure that the criminal justice system is as fair as possible and that we do and exercise it with the utmost integrity. And so a lot of what I'm doing is, is geared towards putting in those guardrails um, for going forward. I think it's our job to um, think of ways to help victims in innovative and thoughtful ways. Um, our job to engage with community partners um, in programs and initiatives um, to help people try and avoid uh, the criminal justice system and incarceration altogether and to re-enter um, society as productive um, members of the community. Um, so those are some of my goals and um, I look forward to working with some of you to hopefully achieve those and I'm happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you so much, D.A. Roca. And, and again, before we get to the questions, I also was uh, would really want to acknowledge our sponsors uh, for today's program. Uh, and again, we really do appreciate their ongoing support to the Business Council of Westchester, uh, Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, Levitt First Insurance, and Thale Industries. Thank you all for your support. Um, we do have a, a, a few, a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to get to them. But I have one that I just have to ask because as an old time uh, politician who's someone who had to uh, used to campaign retail at subway stops at bus stops and other ways, you had a campaign for office during a pandemic. Uh, so I'm curious just how you were able to get your message out. Uh, obviously you ran in a primary against an incumbent um, and incumbencies, incumbents usually have that type of advantage from name ID and everything else. Uh, but again, running for office for the first time running during a pandemic, trying to get your message out to voters. How did that all happen? Um, look, we, you know, I had a great campaign manager um, who was very um, innovative and pivoted. I mean, there was about a month there where I would say we were frozen pizza, as my kids would say, um, and weren't quite sure, you know, and it just didn't feel appropriate to campaign, frankly, given um, the crisis that was uh, developing on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, once we found our footing, um, you know, we, like every business um, across Westchester, were creative and innovative and um, did what we could by, by Zoom, um, did a little less by mail, because that was back in the time where we all were even afraid to touch the mail, um, but a lot of Zoom outreach. And I, I really had the benefit of um, grassroots support. Um, which I think um, is was was key because you know the, the people were at home and they were on social media and they were emailing and uh, you know writing postcards still you know to um, each other and and for cause so in some ways people had more time um, to dedicate to something um, that they felt positive about and kind of needed that so um, I suppose that was maybe one of the silver linings. Um, but really, I, you know, I, I think also that it, it's both because of the year, the hard year um, that everyone has had because of COVID, but also because of what was happening um, nationally in terms of the conversation on police um, reform and, and uh, around that area. Um, you know, people were ready for change and for, for somebody to um, really put into action some kind of change. And I, I say that over and over because I think what am I, if you ask me right now what my greatest fear is, it's that I would be all talk and no action. I, I, I mean, as someone who has not been a politician her whole life, but has watched elected officials, nothing drives me more crazy. And so I'm really trying very hard and I'm very conscious of that on a daily basis. And I think people 
sense that and, and understand that that's what I'm trying to do. Again, for people who would like to pose a question to Dia Roca, please put it into the chat box. Um, obviously, the attention uh, around the country and uh, is right now focused on Minnesota. Uh, and not only do we have a trial that's going on right now, uh, but obviously the tragic uh, shooting that happened this weekend. Uh, as someone who now is, you know, always is preparing to make sure that, and God forbid it ever, this ever happens in Westchester County, what are some of the lessons that you're seeing in Minnesota uh, that you would want to implement in Westchester County or things that you might even want to do differently to, again, uh, make sure that justice is, is served in the right way? So, I mean, this is something I think about literally every day, um, sometimes at night <laughs> when I should be sleeping, because I do, as someone in this position right now, feel an immense responsibility to try and do more. So obviously, um, you know, the sort of most basic things that I can do, and I have to, in some ways, realize the limits of, of what I can do, but but there's a lot, um, was to increase our um resources, our staffing, our investigators who focus on public integrity and law enforcement integrity cases. Um, I, you know, when I first addressed the law enforcement, the Chiefs Association here in Westchester, um, I think it was my first week in office, the first thing I said to them was, I want to address the elephant in the room. I don't hate police officers. I am not anti-cop. I, I grew up, I've spent my whole career with law enforcement. I do believe that most of law enforcement um, is quote, good. But I know, and I absolutely will say out loud, and I will say it to them, and I will say it here, and I think that's an important part of the process, that we have corruption, that we have abuse of power, and that that gets protected even by good officers. And that's something that we really have to break down. And that's something um, that I am working on constantly. Um, I also, as I start to see, like I, the example I gave um, about strip search policies in a particular department, um, when I see patterns of conduct, um, you know, wh whether it be within a particular department or frankly across the county, I will, I do, I have on a daily basis, I reach out to the police chiefs and say, you know, this manner of record keeping that you're doing doesn't allow us to say, to tell, um, when an officer is being truthful or not being truthful in their reports, um, things like that. Um, patterns that I've noticed about off-duty police officers that I think could use some change. So um, some of it is very informal, frankly. Um, we're looking for ways to more holistically and formally um, reach out to law enforcement and bring the community in. Uh, to, to bring about some of these reforms. A lot of them are happening already on the county level because of the uh, reimagining police uh, reform task force. But you know, I wanna go a little bit beyond that and, and I, because I'm in a different position. And so I, I do try to do that on, a very, on both a micro level, but, but also um, a, a more broad macro level. And our conviction review unit will be a big part of that because it will not just be looking at things going forward, but taking a look um, with a whole new perspective, I hope, of things that may have happened in the past. And it's, uh, again, from just the description that you gave as you put your team together, you've actually brought in former law enforcement officials to, you know, to really be in positions to lead different departments. So that, does that help in terms of the line of communication between local law enforcement and your team? I hope so. I mean, I brought in my chief investigator is uh, Dan McKenna, who's a former head of uh, the FBI White Plains uh, office, um, who I worked with for many years, and so who knows much of many of law enforcement um, here in Westchester, because the FBI had task forces and worked collaboratively with all the departments. So most of the police chiefs um, and, and, and uh, police officers um, uh, know him and respect him and but I know personally from working with him that he has you know the utmost integrity um, and so it, it is a really good bridge because if there's a problem that we see he's a good messenger um, a credible messenger I think to departments um, similarly I brought in um, Wade Hardy um, as my deputy chief investigator uh, Wade was a longtime White Plains um, sergeant um, and then went to Con Edison to be head of their security. 
um, but he's also a leader in the Rockland uh, Westchester Guardians Association. So he too is very well known and respected um, by law enforcement. And you know, I, I, I think that that's important because I do look at this at, at, at least, um, you know, at, at we have to try to make this a partnership of reform. It, I, do, I think that's what works best if we try to reform from within and together. And I will say, I, I for the most part, um, have had great receptiveness from um, many of the wonderful police chiefs that we have in this county. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say everything is perfect and there's no need for improvement. And, you know, I, I said for the most part, but it is for the most part. And um, when I reached out after the January 6th attacks and said, you know, I think we need a joint statement um, here from law enforcement across the county condemning um, what happened there and letting people here know that they can have faith in their um, in, in law enforcement here to equally and fairly um, protect and, 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 and defend uh, the laws. Um, they, they, the Chiefs Association, which is, you know, all the police chiefs across the county were, were it, it didn't take convincing. They were ready to do that and to put out a very strong statement. And I understand it's just a statement, but I think in this time in particular, it's very important. We've got a lot of questions on the topic of scams and cybersecurity because everybody obviously over the last year during the pandemic has been online so much, uh, doing shopping online, giving information online. Uh, is there any uh, things that your offices are, are, are focusing on to protect, uh, especially the most vulnerable seniors uh, from cybersecurity or scams? Yeah, so I've said this for a long time because as a federal prosecutor, I worked on senior uh, elder fraud cases as well. And, you know, there are certain cases that make your blood boil. Um, these, these are those. <laughs> these are one of those um, targeting elderly vulnerable people at this stage in their life. Um, but all identity theft and um, online um, cyber fraud, as we call it, is, 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 it's the kind of thing that nobody either hasn't been the victim themselves or, or no, you know, doesn't know someone who has. And it, while it may not be a violent crime, it is so disruptive to our lives. It can cause economic loss, um, frustration at a time, you know, that people are already sort of at their wits end. So um, we, we had uh, victims in our office. We, we had a scam where a good number of prosecutors in our office were victims of a, a certain scam. So um, we have been putting out on social media um, warnings about um, particular scams that we're seeing because obviously you know these do go in waves in terms of patterns um, what I've learned over my time in law enforcement is that um, you know they'll sort of do a certain scam it works for a while people catch on and then they move on to the next technique the next uh, approach the next scam so we have to try to you know spot them early on and give people the warnings and empower them um, so that that is one um, uh, approach that we're doing. Um, we do have um, obviously cyber crime specialists in our office. And again, the Westchester Intelligence Center, which is something that's been run by the DA's office um, for many years, uh, was started under um, uh, DA uh, Di Fiore. Um, but we are reinvigorating and trying to repurpose it really um, to help uh, work proactively on issues like this, because it's all about social media monitoring, um, data collection, um, information sharing, and working more closely with um, the county police and our real -time, their real-time crime center, which is an excellent tool um, for law enforcement to, to, to work really work together more in partnership to try and prevent these. And obviously, as we get these cases, I mean, these are cases that we will um, aggressively pursue. Uh, someone's asked the question, a lot of attention has been put to the abuse of plea bargaining. Is something being done to make this process more just? So this is something I'm, I'm very uh, attuned to um, as a federal prosecutor. I mean, this is something on a, on a daily basis that, you know, we think about, uh, that, that I have thought about and, and, and talk about with prosecutors that I've supervised um, both at the federal level and now here. Um, you know, I think that um, a lot of it actually comes in 
the day-to-day -day discretion that our prosecutors have. Um, I won't know about, I mean, I can institute policies on pleas and we are looking at some of those. We've been asked to look at those with respect to uh, DWIs, for example. Um, and, and other areas where, you know, we might have certain sort of global policies and how those apply and whether those should apply and whether those should be changed. So we are looking at those, but it is also very much a day-to-day -day discretion, right? And this is where, I mean, the power of the prosecutor does lie in the discretion that they have in individual cases. And so this is where I, um, and my, my chief assistant, I mean, we spend a lot of time, probably more um, than most DAs on individual cases and going over them with the prosecutors, with our supervisors to try to um, talk about these kinds of issues. You know, when are we going to make the plea offer and are we using this in um, a way that is um, arguably, you know, coercive um, to, to, to get a, a plea um, you know, we, there's, there's a balance there. And so it, it, it's not necessarily something that can be written in a policy and paper, but it's more something that we can teach on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how we're looking at the cases. Uh, next question is one that, it, again, is it, uh, it's unfortunately, it's, a, it, it's an issue in a crime that has no geographic boundaries and that's domestic violence. Um, are there strategies that you are putting into place or things uh, long-term that you feel your office can do uh, to uh, help the victims of domestic violence? Yes, um, we have been doing a lot of work. I mean, I will say, first of all, our office, the, the Westchester DA's office has, as I mentioned um, in my remarks, the Special Prosecutions Division and the Domestic Violence Bureau um, is excellent. I mean, there are really dedicated, incredibly hardworking um, people there who, you know, deal with really tough cases, um, tough on an on a evidentiary way and tough on an emotional way. Um, we're looking to strengthen that. Um, and, uh, you know, that means um, making sure that we are uh, doing more outreach and partnering even more with our community partners who are the ones who in many ways, you know, are, um, you know, whether it be my sister's place, the Pace Women's Justice Center, uh, Neighbors Link, I mean, so many different community um, groups, uh, service providers that get the incoming day to day that sometimes will make it to our office in terms of a case and sometimes won't. Um, so part of my um, thinking in putting, I mentioned a leadership, another leadership position, Michelle Lopez uh, became the deputy division chief in special prosecutions. She was head of our sex crimes bureau. We brought that into special prosecutions. She's now a division uh, leader as well. And so Fred Green, who had been the longtime division chief, now has more time and energy to be able to do more of the outreach and partnering with those community partners, um, which I think is such an important part of this. Um, I helped form the Westchester Anti-Trafficking Task Force when I was a federal prosecutor, which was also in collaboration with the Westchester DA's office um, and my sister's place and many other community partners. And I know how incredibly valuable those personal relationships became um, in a time of crisis uh, for individuals in our county. And so I think that that's kind of, you know, equally, if not more important when it comes to domestic violence. Um, you know, during the pandemic, our office actually um, in 2020 handled as many domestic violence cases as pre-pandemic, which is pretty incredible when you think about it because it was, I mean, we had, you know, domestic violence aides and prosecutors still being able to reach out and communicate with and give the service um, to domestic violence victims in a time that was incredibly um, fragile and, 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 and um, dangerous for them because they were locked in their homes. Now, I think that the number of domestic violence cases was higher because, and so the fact that we have the same number of cases still means, unfortunately, I think that some cases um, did not get reported um, as would have in the past because people couldn't because they were trapped in their homes. But again, together with the service providers and community partners, we were able to keep those lines of communication greatly open. And that's, that's a real credit to the, the people in, in our office, I think. Um, 
A few years ago, the, the state legislature passed the major criminal justice reform package. Bail reform was one of those keys uh, pieces of legislation that obviously is still getting a lot of attention. Um, so far from what you're seeing, what's working with bail reform? What's not working with bail reform? Are there some things that you're going to be suggesting uh, to the state legislature that they look at if they need to tighten things up in that area or not? So, yes, I mean, this is a big topic. Um, I, look, I, I think we still have to keep saying, even though it's a little bit obvious, but it, it sometimes gets lost in the debate. The thing that's working most of all, and, and I don't think anybody in law enforcement disagrees with this, is that people are not being held in jail. People are not being incarcerated and penalized just because they can't afford to pay bail. And that was, that was the main goal of bail reform. And, and we have to keep reminding ourselves of that, I think, because very few people are gonna disagree with that because it doesn't even help public safety, right? It doesn't help public safety to have the same person, uh, a person who committed the same crime, one in, one out, because one could afford to pay it and one couldn't. It just doesn't. So it doesn't make public safety sense and it's, and it, and it's certainly not um, ethical in my mind. Um, so that is working. Um, there were, you know, I think the first round of, you know, tweaks or re-reforms or whatever you want to call it did help a lot from, from what I hear from law enforcement in terms of filling some of the holes um, that, that were um, present in the, in the first, uh, in the reforms, which overall were good, but, you know, like everything, they, they need to be uh, fine-tuned. Um, I think that first round of reforms, from what I've heard from law enforcement, did help a lot in terms of um, giving, you know, trying to give protections to uh, victims of domestic violence, for example, um, in um, trying to uh, deal with things like, you know, where somebody who uh, committed a burglary in a home, um, there was no bail set for because the definition of burglary is so broad. It also includes people who walk into a lobby in an apartment building and take a package. Those are two very different crimes and they need to be treated differently. But in the original uh, bail reform, they were all lumped together as burglary. Um, they need to be treated differently. So that kind of attention to detail. Um, I think Overall, and I, I think we're still early on, and particularly because of the pandemic, I think it's really hard to have a clear picture yet. And I am, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but I am a data person. I really believe that when it comes to making criminal justice policy, we need to be driven by as much as we can. Um, there's a human side to all of this, of course, but we do need numbers. There are numbers, there is data. And just like we do in every other field of importance, you know, medicine, science, um, even politics, you know, we, we need to look, we need to have a, at least a, a fuzzy picture based on numbers. And we don't have that yet. There are studies underway. Um, when I hear someone say, oh, bail reform has caused a rise in crime, I say, well, are the arrests that are being made, are those people who would have previously been detained? Tell me that, show me that. If that's true, then yeah, we, we've got to work on that. But nobody has those numbers yet. And, and particularly because of the pandemic, they're very skewed. So we're going to try to help collect some of that data. That's another whole area of mine that um, we're working on developing in our office. But, but there are a lot of outside groups doing those studies as well that I think will really um, help inform the policy going forward. But I do think there probably one area I would say that I think we need to do some work on um, is repeat offenders, people who um, have you know, 10, 20 uh, different um, offenses and, and there's, there's no discretion for a judge to do something other than just let them walk out the door. And, and, and that's, that's probably something we need to work on. Another subject, I'm going to take a step backwards. I know you touched on this, but I think uh, this is an interesting question. Um, and it has to do with cultural and behavioral change in policing. Uh, and obviously, this is stemming from what we're seeing uh, in Minnesota. Um, the question is, for instance, to have officers help colleagues avoid tragic errors such as overuse of lethal force. Are there things, again, in your office that, as, uh, that you're going to be, again, communicating with law enforcement on things that they should be focusing on and prioritizing and during training, obviously even at the academy level. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's tricky, right? Because um, again, my job as DA is not to, whether I want to or not, it, it is not to tell police 
departments how to do their job. It's just not, and that wouldn't be well received and, and frankly is, is above and beyond what I, I could do. That said, I am looking for ways to um, take what we are seeing, what we are learning, where we think there can be improvement and suggest or partner in training. So for example, back to hate crimes, it's a little bit off topic, but I just wanna give this example. You know, I think people in our office and law enforcement need training on how to handle incoming reports of bias incidents and hate crimes. In other words, I don't, I don't just mean the law. I mean, how to respond in a, in a way that lets people feel heard, that gets the information, but also doesn't belittle an incident that can be small to seem small, but is very upsetting to people on a level um, that maybe the person taking the call or the complaint doesn't quite understand. Um, and, and, and that's that's all of us. Again, that's an us thing. So we're working on a training for our office as well as for um, law enforcement in that area. But yes, I mean, when I see specific areas that I think there needs to be improvement, whether it be countywide, um, training, um, you know, or individual police departments, I mean, Westchester is um, so unique in this way of having 42 police departments. And, and it, 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 so it, it makes reform harder, quite frankly, um, because you, you have to look at each department individually. The county police, which um, are wonderful partners and I have a wonderful relationship with, you know, they do a lot of the training, but, but that's about it. And so um, there's, 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 a, there's, there's hurdles <laughs> there for reform, but I'm not saying we're not trying, we are. Um, and I do think a lot of it is cultural and pointing out things that maybe people hadn't thought about before. Um, I do know that a lot of departments on their own um, have been adopting this um, ABLE training, it's called, A-B-L-E, which is um, largely about um, you know, the uh, reduction of use of force um, using the least, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting the terminology wrong that they use, but um, it, it is about, um, um, it's also about intervention by other officers when they see escalation. It's about de-escalation, that's what I was looking for. Um, and so I think that's wonderful and that's something that a lot of departments are doing. I, I hope that every department uses it. From what I've heard, it's, it's an excellent program that can really go a long way because it is about de-escalation. It is about um, viewing law enforcement as guardians and not warriors. And you know, a lot of the police chiefs and, and police officers that I talk to um, have that view. I, I won't say all, but a lot, and that's very encouraging. We have time for one last question and we have a lot, so uh, we'll have to have you back. Um, and this has to do with community engagement. Um, and again, you've touched on some of that, but what organizations um, are your office working we have to ensure that the community is engaged and heard and building lines of communication uh, with the business community as well. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is something that we, again, think about, I literally was on a call last night about this, you know, how, how do we um, both get the word out more about what we are doing and let the community, whatever part of the community we're talking about, whether it be the business community, the immigrant community, um, you know, the community members um, in disadvantaged areas, so community members um, who feel, you know, the bail reform is, uh, you know, hurting the safety in their uh, area. I mean, we, we want to be able to hear from everybody. Um, some of it we'll agree with, some of it we won't, some of it we'll be able to do something with, some of it we won't, but, but I think that making the office more accessible, making me more accessible, um, has been a big part of what we're trying to do. That's the idea for the hotline. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of, um, you know, part of the, the rationale for having these different coordinators like the hate and bias crime coordinator, uh, like the immigration and worker safety coordinator, you know, is for the, it, you know, I'm one person, but those people with are developing expertise and real partnerships with community groups, right? They're, they're emailing on a daily basis now. They're setting up, uh, you know, um, um, Zoom talks. Um, they're having people bring um, uh, complaints uh, directly to them. 
Um, and we should do something similar with, with the business community. I mean, I think um, you know, there, there should be a point person essentially in the office for, for as many groups as possible, as many uh, different interest groups, if you will, if possible. Um, so that it, it, it isn't such a um, random process, if you will. We have an online complaint form for people, obviously, who um, that we revamped and actually, again, works and gets reviewed and responded to. But I think that when we're talking about particular um, groups, we, we, we should have a, a point person um, that is essentially their, their first line of contact. Oh. DA Roca, thank you. And as the county's largest business membership organization uh, that really does focus on economic development and advocacy, uh, we hope this is the beginning of that type of relationship that you just mentioned, um, that we can be a resource for you, uh, that you can tap into the expertise that so many of our members I know would be willing to do to help improve uh, the quality of life in the communities, which is good for business uh, as we move forward. So this is the first of many ongoing open discussions that we will have, but thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, again, we wanna thank our sponsors, Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, Levitt First uh, Insurance and Thale Industries, reminding everyone that again, next Wednesday, the 21st, we have our Board of Legislators virtual reception at 4.30. And on April 30th, we have our virtual Albany Lobby Day. Uh, you can go to our website to register for all of uh, those events. And uh, as always, uh, we wish our members to remain safe, uh, to continue to wear a mask, uh, and when you can, get that vaccine and encourage others to get that vaccine as well. Everyone have a very good day. DA Roca, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye.